Thank you, Dagmar. Um, hello and welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Karsten, and I work for Menomice in the Services Department, and I will be your host for today's webinar on Bind9 Logging Best Practices. So we will talk about um, the configuration of Bind9 Logging, so how to get the uh, logging configured in the namedy.conf configuration file. We talk about the different logging categories and what will in will be in each category. <clears throat> we talk in detail about uh, query and debug logging, which is a little bit special in Bind9. And then we have Bind9 logging configuration templates for you. So if you uh, want to start a new Bind configuration or you want to compare our uh, standard configuration to your logging configuration, you can have a look there. And then I will present to you uh, a couple of tools that we use internally at Men and Mice to um, go through bind log files, which are the log eater tools. Uh, we make them open source uh, today, and you can download the source code as well as uh, um, binary versions for Linux, macOS, and Windows. Uh, and we have the download link for you later in the slides. And then at the end, I talk about a concept that is not only useful for bind logs, but also for any kind of log information uh, that is artificial ignorance. And uh, we come back or I explain what that is in detail uh, at the end of this webinar. But first, let's have a look on the bind9 logging configuration. Compared to other Unix daemons like the Apache web server or the uh, Postfix mail server, uh, Bind9 has quite a sophisticated log infrastructure built in. Uh, it is more or less even more powerful than the uh, syslog daemons that are in, in some Unix systems. Um, so, for example, we can define several uh, destinations for log information, which are called the, the channels. Uh, so we can log to uh, syslog, we can write to files, we can write to the standard error, and uh, we can even discard certain log information when we log to the null channel. And then we have uh, several categories uh, that select log messages of a certain type. For example, there's one category of security, which has all security-related uh, log messages. And then another one about the configuration. And every log message about configuration issues go into that category. And then we have the severity, which mirror the severities from the syslog, uh, meaning that we have something like debug, info, warning, error, fatal, and um, it works that way that uh, in the logging statements, you can select the lowest level of severity that you want to see. And then you get that level plus all the levels above. So if you select info, you of course get also error and fatal. Um, but if you only select uh, errors, um, that is severity error, you don't see the info and the warnings. And it contains a date timestamp. Um, with each um, entry, which is quite handy if you need to compare multiple log files from multiple machines, uh, aggregate them. And it also has uh, built-in log file rotations based on the size of the log file. Uh, so there's, uh, with the bind uh, server, there's no need to deploy any external log rotation service like, uh, like log rotate on Linux. You can do that, but it's not required because it's built in. So when we set up bind logging, we more or less wire the categories which define what to log to the channels which define where the log information should end up. And we can have multiple categories point to the same channel, like in this example here on the slide, security and DNSSEC and the default all being sent to syslog. And it can be that way that one category is locked multiple times. So the category default here at the 
lower right side of the slide. That is being logged to both the syslog and to standard out. And this kind of wiring that is being done in the configuration file. There is a default category which is a little bit special in um, the way that it is not like the other categories that it defines messages of a certain type, but instead it is a sinkhole for all the categories that the bind developer thought are important to know for an administrator and are not sent anywhere else. So if you just use the default category, um, then you have all the messages which are from the point of the bind developers are um, important to, to know about. One example is, uh, sorry, one exception is the queries category because query logging, we will come to that later in, uh, in more detail, um, is very resource intensive and can slow down a DNS server. So query logging is not enabled by default and it doesn't go through the default category. Here we have on the left side an example logging configuration for Bind9 server. This is a, a snippet out of a larger namely.conf. And the log configuration always starts with the keyword logging and then the curly braces include or enclose the log configuration. And in the upper part of the log configuration we define the channel, that is where to log. And here we have a channel syslog which uh, goes to the syslog daemon and uh, logs with the syslog severity of info. Then we have a channel standard out, which goes to standard error, and it also has the severity of info. And then we have a file channel called transfer underscore log, and that goes into the file in the directory var named the transfer.log, and we want to keep 10 versions of this file, and each file should be 10 megabyte in size, meaning that if the original file transfer.log is growing and it reaches the 10 megabyte threshold, Bind will automatically roll over that file, rename it into var namely transfer.log.1 and will open a new var namely transfer.log and will start logging into that file. And we'll do that 10 times and at the end the oldest one will be thrown away. So with this configuration, we can always be sure that all the logging about zone transfers, which we will put into the transfer log, will at maximum take 100 megabyte on the disk. That prevents that uh, the disk runs full and uh, stops our server. Also here we log with severity info and above, but now again, we want also to have the timestamp printed, we want to have the severity printed, and we want to have the category printed. Printing the category is always recommended if you send more than one category into a channel, so that you can figure out which log entry comes from which category, so that you can fine-tune your logging later on. The names being used for the channels transfer underscore log, also stand out syslog, are just names. They have no special meaning. You can use any names you like. Just be sure that you use the same names below in the uh, lower part of the configuration that you have used in uh, the beginning for configuring the channels. So at the lower end of the configuration we see the wiring of the categories to the channels. Uh, we have the keyword category and then the different categories and there are a lot of them in the Bindham server. We will go over them and then in curly braces we list all the channels where the log entries for this category should be logged in. So here in this example we send everything security related to the syslog, uh, everything about the queries to the query underscore log uh, category X for in and X for out, which stands for zone transfer incoming and zone transfer outgoing, goes to the transfer log. And DNSSEC goes to syslog and default goes both to syslog and to standard out.
there are four predefined channels in the bind name server that are always there that we can use, so we don't need to define them. There is a default underscore syslog, which sends to the syslog daemon. There is a default standard error, which writes to standard error file descriptor. There is a default debug, which writes to a file called named.run, but only if debug logging is enabled. Uh, we come to that later, how to enable this debug logging. And there's a channel called null, which is the, the trash can. Everything that is sent to the null channel will disappear. That is uh, useful if uh, there are some messages in the default channel and you want to lock the default channel and you don't want to see particular messages, then you can take out these messages by sending the category of these messages to the null channel. So we we'll, we'll still see all the other messages in default, just not that one category that has a different channel configuration. If the bind configuration file has no logging statement at all, so there's nothing configured, then bind defaults to syslog. So the default configuration that we see here is that all the category default is being sent both to the default syslog and to the default debug, which is the file name need to run. And <clears throat> the category unmatched is going to null. Uh, unmatched, uh, we will see in, in a moment, is everything, um, every query that is not being matched by any configuration uh, and that therefore cannot be um, um, worked on by the bind name server. Uh, that usually only appears if you work with views in bind 9. Um, relatively new in, I think, bind 9.10 and not really visible in the help file is the minus uppercase L parameter for the name D, where you can uh, specify a default log file. And the default category uh, will be then locked into that file instead of this log if you start bind with that parameter. Um, quite, quite handy sometimes, especially if uh, you do local debugging on the machine and you want for uh, a limited amount of time send the log output to a file instead to syslog. Now we have a look at the bind logging categories. Uh, I already talked about the default category, which is everything that is not sent to any of the other channels or not explicitly configured goes to default. Then we have the client category, uh, which has information about processing of client requests. I usually don't configure the client category because I find there's not so often helpful information there that, or uh, very seldom it, it locks at all. The CNAME category locks name servers where the domain name of the name server on the right hand side is of an NS record is actually a C name instead of an A or quad A record. And that is forbidden by the RFC. And this can create problems. Um, and problems in so far that a bind server being, or any other name server being a resolver, might have problems resolving that name. Now, I don't lock the C name category because that is what's called uh, a problem of other people. Um, it is a misconfiguration on the far end side, that is of other people name servers. And usually there's nothing I can do as an operator of a resolver to, to fix the other names, uh, name servers. It might be useful if you run bind in an internal DNS environment where also the authoritative servers that are on, all authoritative servers are seen are belonging to your environment, to your corporation, company or so, uh, where you have the ability to make changes to the environment. But if you do that on the internet, usually uh, CNAME logging creates a couple of, of error entries, but you can, there's nothing you can do about that. 
Um, then the config category is about parsing the configuration file and processing the configuration file. That could be handy, but I would recommend to replace that logging uh, with uh, calling named check conf uh, before reloading your name server or starting your name server because that will find all the configuration issues before you start the name server and before um, it can affect the, the life of operations of the name server. So also config is something that I rarely uh, configure in my name servers. A database is all about the internal databases of the bind name server where it stores zone data and cache data also something that I usually don't log. Uh, delegation only uh, is, uh, is more or less a workaround that appeared like 10 years ago, maybe even more years ago, when uh, the operator of the .com zone uh, started to put in um, uh, wildcards into the com zone to catch missed uh, typos in um, uh, in, in browsers to, to redirect them to some advertising page. And to, in, in, in order to counter that, Bind has this delegation only uh, configuration setting where you can define a certain top level domains as being delegation only. So there shouldn't be any actual authoritative data that like, like A records or quad A records in that zone. And if it happens, then uh, that is a zone is being configured as delegation only and there still is uh, a data in there, but bind overrides it and sends an annex domain as a result, uh, that will be locked here. The operator of the .com zone, they stop this practice and it's, it's, it's not really needed today to make this work around. So also this um, login category is quite obsolete uh, in, in this regard. Uh, the dispatch is about incoming package and, and how they dispatch to the different server modules inside the bind server, also rarely used. What I often use is DNSSEC. Uh, on a resolver that is uh, uh, DNSSEC validation enabled, there we see all the uh, validation issues um, and, and that is quite useful if um, a customer complains that a certain domain name cannot be resolved. Uh, that can be then found in the DNSSEC logging, usually with uh, enough information to um, to see why the domain name couldn't be resolved, um, what's the problem on the far end side on the authoritative servers. A DNS tab is the DNS traffic capture system. Uh, you should enable DNS tab logging if you use DNS tab. If you don't have DNS tab enabled, uh, there's no need to log this category. If you want to learn more about DNS tab, there was a minimized webinar last year about this uh, topic. So you can find that on YouTube or on the minimized sites and uh, watch the recording. EDNS disabled. Um, EDNS, extended DNS, is an extension mechanism for the DNS protocol and it's been used since 1998. Uh, but still there are some networks and middle boxes and maybe all DNS servers that don't understand uh, EDNS. And bind, by default, will try EDNS first. So it will send a query or it will, uh, yeah, it will send a query with EDNS data. And if a middle box, like a firewall, a very old firewall, doesn't understand EDNS, what happens sometimes is that the firewall just drops the package on the floor and will not respond. And also the uh, destination name server will not respond. Uh, so bind just runs into a timeout. Um, bind will then try another, another time with EDNS enabled and then a third time without EDNS. And when the third try succeeds, then bind concludes that somewhere on the way is a box that doesn't understand EDNS. So on that way, talking to that remote machine, we cannot use EDNS and we'll store that information in memory and it will lock this information. I have EDNS disabled category uh, often on just to see where these problems appear 
and um, sometimes this gives a hint about other name resolution problems, not only eDNS related, because remote networks that don't have eDNS support enabled by now, they often have other misconfigurations or other hardware old software running that can create problems. Um, general is the catch-all category that everything that doesn't fit in any of the other categories go there. Uh, I, I have that enabled. Uh, lame servers. Lame servers is about misconfiguration on remote servers. Um, there can be many different ways to create a lame server. Um, the same as with the CNAME logging, this is a problem that as an operator of a DNS resolver, we cannot solve this. And it's very obsolete, uh, not obsolete, but it's information that doesn't really help us in, in the operation. So I often don't configure lame servers or even I send lame servers category to the null channel to make it disappear so that, that it doesn't clutter the default log channel. Um, network category is all about network operations, so sending UDP, TCP packages, and if there is like a congestion somewhere in uh, TCP, you get that locked. Uh, notify is a notify protocol. I configure notify logging together with the zone transfer because it is a part of uh, notifying slave servers and then slave servers doing the zone transfer, so it, it fits in the uh, theme of, of zone transfers. A query logging should be disabled by default, um, but can be in the logging and then enabled on demand. If you have query logging, you also want to have query errors, uh, because it logs vital information why certain queries couldn't be resolved and uh, why certain error conditions happen. So query errors is the log file where I look first if a customer asks, uh, connect, contacts, contacts me about uh, certain domains that couldn't be resolved. Rate limiting, um, that's of interest if you want to see who is abusing your name server. You should have rate limiting enabled on authoritative servers and sometimes on recursive servers, on, on caching servers. Uh, we had a webinar about rate limiting and bind and how to configure that also, uh, I think, uh, two years ago. Uh, you can find the details there. Um, Resolver is about DNS resolution. Uh, together with query errors, this is one of the most important categories and should be uh, locked. RPZ is the response policy zones about rewriting responses. Uh, you should lock that when you uh, have RPZ response policy zones enabled in your configuration. Security is about uh, approval and denial of requests. Basically, this locks all the access control list violations, uh, and that should be locked. Uh, you can see also there who is trying to abuse your name server. Spill is interesting if you have a heavy duty DNS server which is under uh, heavy load, uh, especially a resolver, because the spill category locks everything that has to be uh, dropped or uh, negatively responded with serve fail because the server was just too busy. Uh, the bind name server has a queue of requests it currently works on, and if uh, a query in a resolver is too long in this queue, it will be thrown out in favor of some new queries coming in. And uh, when it, it's been thrown out, because it's too old, too long in the queue, it will be locked here in this. And you want to, you want to know about that. And, and spill is, is, is a log file uh, that's also useful to, <clears throat> to monitor. Uh, if there's uh, a lot of uh, uh, spillage happening, you want to have a, a proactive notification from your monitoring system, because then if something is going wrong, maybe you have a denial of service attack or something similar. Uh, unmatched is about um, messages that where bind cannot find a configuration view uh, for the class or the um, um, <clears throat> the IP address um, configured. Um, so this is if you use views. So a query is coming in and no matching view is being found. If you have views and you don't have a catch-all view, then you should 
lock the unmatched category. Update and update security. If you have dynamic updates, if you have dynamic zones, you should lock both. And then the last ones are X for in, X for out, about the incoming zone transfers and the outgoing zone transfers. Useful for an authoritative server where you have actually zone transfers. Query logging is a special case um, because it can slow down a binding name server. Uh, it, if you have a server that receives about like 100 or 200 queries per second, um, then having query logging enabled on a modern machine is not a problem at all. However, if you have a very busy name server, um, like you are a big ISP or a cable company or something like that, and you have uh, something like 400 thousand queries per second, then enabling query logging can really, really a performance hog. Uh, we have seen that the performance drops about half when query logging is enabled. And that it depends on the hardware and the uh, also the, the speed of the logging uh, destination, like if you log to a file, how fast the, the hard disk or the SSD can consume data. Um, but be very careful with query logging if you have a very busy, busy server. <clears throat> now, what's in the query logging? When you have query logging enabled, the binding server will log every query that's coming in. It will log what's, what is in the incoming queries. So it will not log what was, what is the answer being sent out. You, you don't see the answers. You only see the queries coming to your server. So we have a date and timestamp. <clears throat> We have the client's IP address and the port number of the client. Then we have in parentheses the domain name being requested, first time. <clears throat> we have it a second time, and we'll see why this is important to have it two times in the query logging. Um, then we have the actual query name, which is, again, the domain name being queried, alpha.zone02dnslab.org in this case. Network class, record type, a record in this case, and then the flags that has been set in the query. <clears throat> if the flag field starts with a plus, meaning it's a recursive query. It's a query coming from a client system towards our recursive DNS server. If it has a minus, it's an iterative query, a query from another server, usually seen at an authoritative server coming from other recursors. <clears throat> if we have an uppercase E in the flags, meaning uh, the client sending the query has eDNS support. So our binding server will also answer with eDNS. A T would indicate a query over TCP. A D means DNSSEC OK. The client does understand DNSSEC and can receive DNSSEC resource records. A C means checking disabled. Someone is doing some troubleshooting on the DNSSEC data. And if we see a uppercase S, that means the query has been TSIC signed, um, which, for example, happens between authoritative name servers if um, they have a trust relationship with TSIC keys and they do zone transfers or request the SOAR records. And then at the end, after the flag fields, in parentheses, we have the IP address of the network interface where this query has been a uh, received. So if we have a DNS server that has multiple network interfaces, we can see here uh, which interface received this query. Similar to query logging is the debug logging. Uh, remember, debug logging is going to a file called namedy.run, which is in the uh, binds working directory. And, and reading the output is quite technical and requires some knowledge of the binding tunnels. I would recommend to first look at the other log files to find any issues and only use query logging, or sorry, debug logging as the last uh, resort because query logging is very heavy, even heavier than, the debug logging is heavier than the query logging and it can cr create <coughs> vast amounts of output uh, and it takes quite some time to go through them. Uh, to enable query logging, you use RNDC, RNDC trace, and then the number. There are 99 trace levels. Not every level changes really the, the output. So I usually increment the trace level, debug level, in steps of 10. 
um, if you just do RNDC trace, that will increase the DWAG level by one. So here we start with level 10, then RNDC trace will increment to 11. RNDC no trace disables the debugging, same is with RNDC, RNDC trace zero. And RNDC status uh, gives the information uh, on which debug level the my name server is running, and in normal production it should always be on debug level zero. And also after restart, bind automatically starts without debugging enabled. Uh, just be careful, do not leave debug logging enabled on a production server for a longer time. Here's an example how debug logging looks like. Um, at the top we enable debug logging with RDC trace 15, and then we send a query for slaveme.dnslab.org, SOAR record, and look at the namely.run file. And here we see all the different functions inside the by name server that has has been called to process this query. So we see it's an UDP request, it is using the view underscore default, which is the default view if no other view is being defined. The request wasn't T6 signed and recursion is currently not available, so it seems to be here we have an authoritative server and it's a query that we've seen. And the query was for slavemedianslab.org, and that is in parentheses. And then we see uh, the processing in the name server, so it looks for the data, it found the data in the, the green highlighted um, uh, log entry, then it sent it out, and then it goes to the next query, basically cleans up after the packet is being sent out. We see here now that the domain name being requested, slaveme.dnslab.org, is in every um, output message. And this is important if we have a very busy uh, DNS server, because then we have not only one query coming to our name server, but we have thousands of queries maybe coming to our name server. So the log messages will be interleaved from different queries, because um, Bind is doing multitasking. It, it works on multiple queries at the same time, and the log messages will also be shown interleaved. Um, in order to make sense of the log message, you have to you have to group them again per query, and you can do that with the name of the uh, requested domain name in the parentheses. So here we, need, we now have um, um, some some templates. Uh, I won't, won't go into details here. Um, these templates will also appear on uh, the Metamask Services GitHub account. Um, there are there will be included in a full bind name .conf, one configuration for an authoritative server, one for a recursive server, so you can just copy and paste or download from our GitLab, uh, GitHub account and um, use that as a starting point for your own configurations. Uh, they will appear probably <coughs> tomorrow, tomorrow morning. So the first one was for a resolver, and this is a configuration for the authoritative server. Coming now to the Log Eater tools, and the Log Eater tools is a collection of tools uh, uh, we've been developed inside Men and Mice to um, quickly make sense out of uh, large log files, bind log files. So we have um, sometimes the requirement that we that a customer sends us uh, some some gigabyte of, of uh, compressed log files, and once uh, an answer what's wrong in the next ten minutes. So what do you do? Just reading through such a log file will take hours. So we need tools to, to make quickly sense of what's in these log files, and that is what the log eater is for. Uh, you find the source code, uh, it's BSD licensed under our GitHub account, which you see here, and we have made uh, binary executables available uh, that you can find on the Menomize packages download server. Um, I just found an the issue with this uh, slide here, um, you have to give uh, a terminating slash after log eater in the packages minimize.com log eater slash to um, get the, the listing of the files. I will fix that on the slide deck that we will publish after the webinar. Just if you want to download now, be careful to uh, put the final slash on there. Uh, there are currently three tools 
uh, in the log eater uh, tool set and we will uh, publish more once we uh, have them written and there's a need for that. The main part is log eater queries which will go through a bind 9.10 plus style query log file and put out statistics. Um, so you see here the different um, uh, parameters that we can give and all the log eaters they read the log files from standard input so you pipe them on the Unix or Windows command line into the log eaters. Here's an example. Uh, this works this way on uh, any Unix machine. Um, here the query.log is being piped into log eater queries. Minus S means print the statistics. And then the column tool just uh, makes the fancy formatting. Um, that's quite optional. If you don't use that, it's just not aligned the output, but it's still readable. So we see here the number of total queries, number of iterative and recursive queries, number of queries over TCP, uh, number of queries with eDNS support, uh, DNSSEC support, uh, number of queries with DNSSEC validation disabled, uh, meaning the CD flag is on. This can also be um, any application that is DNSSEC aware in the network that wants to do its own DNSSEC validation. Um, and the number of T6 signed queries. <clears throat> Here, other examples, if we use the um, switches minus C for network classes and minus T for network types, we see that in this query log we have uh, 21,000 queries of class internet and six of class uh, chaos. Uh, probably someone asking for version.bind in the chaos class and the majority of queries were for IPv4 and IPv6 uh, address records. Um, and then we had SOA, DNS key, and you see that uh, the other record types in here. Uh, very interesting is who sends the queries. So the, the top 10 uh, IP addresses of uh, sending queries here. And we see that um, in this query log file there were um, 1,571 queries from uh, that one IP address at the top, and then um, VeriSign Labs has, has uh, placed two and three, and so on. Something on Amazon sends queries, and something on Vulture, which is a, a hosting service, also sends queries here. D Besides log eater queries, we have log eater DNSSEC, which goes through the DNSSEC log file, so a log file that contains the category uh, DNSSEC, and that um, makes a list of the top um, DNSSEC issues that are logged there. And so this is very helpful to um, find the, the most common issues that are locked in such a log file. Um, so this is all validation issues here and some um, mangled domain names like the uh, seventh one which is uh, a top level domain dot Cisco which I don't think currently is available and that the, it's, a, it's a bad cache hit um, because there's no DS record for that. And similar for the resolvers, this uh, go through a resolver style log file. So everything category resolvers written in one log file. Um, and that finds the top problems of re uh, name resolution. So this is useful on a DNS resolver. In absence of such a tool like the log eater, um, it's helpful to filter logs with artificial ignorance. Now, artificial ignorance is a concept that has been invented by Marcos Ranum, who is a, a figure in the network security world. He is the guy who actually invented firewalls uh, back in the beginning of the 1990s. And uh, he came up with the concept of artificial ignorance, which means that you filter all the noise away that is in a log file until you see the log entries that you really care of. 
So in order to apply artificial ignorance to a log file, you inspect the log file and then you decide for every log message if it is a serious issue. If it is a serious issue, you go and fix the issue so that the log entry disappears. If it is not a serious issue, but something you just don't care about, you enter the message into a filter expression that filters out this log message in the future. And you repeat these steps, 1a and 1b, until all the messages are gone and you have an empty log file. And then you inspect the, the log file every day for new entries there. And if there's something new, that is something you haven't seen before. This is an outlier. That is something you want to know about, something that ha doesn't happen before. And then if you see something new, you again apply step 1a or 1b. So I, you decide whether it is a serious issue that you need to fix, then you fix it. Or is there something that you want to ignore, then you put it into the, the filter system, so that is filtered out. You can read uh, on this uh, URL here, you read the, the or original um, uh, blog post, no, no blog post, it was a Usenet post at that point of time about artificial ignorance from, from Marcus Rona. Um, in order to use artificial ignorance, you need to have a filter mechanism to filter out everything that you want to ignore. And um, Ron Dilley, uh, a developer, has written a log template, which is an open source tool that implements artificial ignorance. Unfortunately, log template is not packaged in most Linux or Unix distribution, uh, so you have to uh, compile it from the source, but it's not difficult to do, and you have the installation instructions here on the slides. And once it is installed, you can use log templater to go through a log file, and that is any log file, not only bind log files, to get the top X uh, log messages in here. And here I, I logged through the namedy.log, which is my catch-all for all the categories that don't have a, a separate log file. And um, I pipe that into log templater. Log templater will figure out the um, the different messages in the file. The sort command will then sort everything by the number of occurrences, which is in the first column. The SED, the stream editor, will strip away the template information, because we only need the template information if we really want to create a template file later on, and tail just gives me the last 10 entries, which is the 10 most uh, uh, ten most often appearing error messages in that log file. So, and here we I see that the the topmost are um, log messages about um, some dynamic updates uh, occurring, and others are about um, uh, reconfiguring DNSSEC keys. So, with this command in the first column, we see the number of messages of each type. Uh, then the date and time of the first occurrence of a message of this type, the, just the first message that is seen, and then the content of the first occurrence of this message type. Uh, log templater is intelligent enough that it finds um, fields that are changing, like uh, in messages about DNSSEC key reconfigurations are the domain names change and the dates are changing, like the next key events are changing. It is intelligent enough to figure out that there are fields that are changing, but the rest of the message is static, and it can group them into all one message type. And then to filter out, we create what's called an ignore file. Uh, we cat uh, a log file into templater, um, and write then uh, an ignore file out, and then we edit the ignore file, and um, keep everything in there that we want to filter out. Um, it has a very similar structure that the, than the um, output that we have seen before. Um, and once we have done that, we use uh, log template with the ignore file, and the ignore file would automatically filter out all the messages that match the regular expressions in 
the uh, the uh, ignore file, and then we can put that into a cron tab or in a cron daily script and send it out by mail. So we get a daily message, which is hopefully completely empty because then nothing new happened. But if we see any log message there, that is something that we want to uh, look at. So this concludes the webinar today about um, the bind lock um, best practices. Um, we have our dates for the minimized training if you are interested and want to learn more about uh, DNS and binds. We have the Hendon class, which is a three-day class in March in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, in April in Redwood City in the IC headquarters. If you ever wanted to uh, see where BIND is developed and say hi to the developers. You can do that there uh, together with our trainer. Uh, you can also come to Boston uh, on the East Coast in uh, May or in June we have another one in Europe in Zurich in Switzerland. And then we have the advanced training, which is the five-day training, which also includes DNSSEC and uh, a lot of advanced stuff around DNS and bind, and uh, these are basically the same dates, uh, just longer. And uh, the German training is just happening next week, it will be delivered by me in the Linux Hotel in Essen, um, which is um, a three days of uh, DNS and bind and then two days of DNS security. There are still seats open, if you go to linuxhotel.de, you can still sign up for these trainings if you like, and they are guaranteed to, to run. Our next webinar will be a DNSSEC zone signing tutorials, uh, where we will have a, a, a beginner's entry to DNSSEC. Uh, so we will explain how DNSSEC works, and we will start signing a zone using uh, the bind tools and the not DNS server. And as always, it's a 45-minute webinar with a question and answer session at the end, and it will be on March 23rd at uh, the same time as today. And this concludes the webinar today. And uh, Dagmar, do we have any questions? Uh, let me see. Not yet, but I really want to thank you for this very informative uh, webinar, Karsten. As said before, uh, we are ready to take questions. So if you go to the uh, questions functionality of the GoToWebinar, you can start uh, asking questions right away. We'll give it a couple of minutes to see if somebody wants to find out more. And uh, while we're waiting to see if, if questions come in, uh, I encourage you to take a look at our previous webinars that we have hosted throughout the years. They are, uh, you can find the recordings and the slides uh, on our website. Uh, it seems here, Karsten, there's, there's a question here. Let's see. Uh, is it possible to get the log eater binaries for Linux 32-bit? Ah, yes. Uh, sure. Currently, I only compiled it for 64-bit, but certainly possible. Uh, just give me uh, like uh, until tomorrow morning. I will um, create 32-bit uh, binaries and upload them. And that's the nice thing about uh, the Go language. I've written these in the Go language, and the Go language creates static binaries. And static binaries means that everything, every dependency, everything the the program needs is in one file. So um, there's not the danger that some library is missing or some DLL is wrong or something like that. It's fully self-contained and uh, I will create, uh, uh, in addition to the available files, I will create a 32-bit binary as well for tomorrow morning. Okay. Um, there's a, a person asking here, could you please tell me the link for the log eater again? Yes. One moment. Uh, here we are. And uh, remember, on the on the link at the bottom, uh, put a one more slash uh, there. So a slash at the end, and then you should see the list of uh, the files for download. It's uh, it's uh, a zip, either a zip or uh, a tgz that for um, Windows and Mac OS and Linux. You just unpack, and then you can directly from the command line. Uh, start the um, the tools. They they don't have a GUI, so don't 
try to click and, and start them in a GUI environment. It won't work. They will just disappear. You have to use the command line. Sorry about that. Okay, we have another question here. Um, there's a person that asks, has there been any work in bind to improve query logging performance? For example, to reduce the impact it can, it can have. Um, it's it's technically impossible to improve the current the the normal query logging. That is because the the performance impact happens on um, in, in in two uh, situations. The first situation is uh, creating the the string of the message in memory. That is uh, that because that's a memory copy uh, that happens and that is slow. And the second impact is writing out to disk, which is also slow because disk is slow compared to, to memory. However, um, what's what's have been done is the the invention of DNS tab. And actually DNS tab is um, is query logging and more without the performance impact. Uh, because query logging um, postpones the, the 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 conversation into into readable strings to later because it locks out binary data and then there's another tool where you can then read the binary data and that binary data creates the human readable output but that is independent from the bind operation so uh, with DNS tab you can uh, have all the benefits of query logging without the performance impact. Okay. Um... We just got a notification here that um, the um, the link for the log eater isn't working. Probably, could you check and rectify later? Later. Yes. Yes. Let Let me quickly um, quickly copy that and, and and because I've just before the uh, webinar I've tested it and it worked for me there. Let me start Safari. Um, here. And then you have to put a slash at the end. And I will fix that in the slides. And still, it doesn't work. You were right. Ha, huh, I fixed that. OK. So here we have another question. It says, what version of bind is DNS tab available in? Uh, I don't remember. It was in the DNS tab webinar. I think bind 9, 10, and 9, 11. But it might be only 9/11, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, it's it's in the other webinar, but I don't know that from the tip of my head. So you you have to uh, look at the um, uh, the bind documentation uh, of the latest bind version. So it's it's definitely not in bind 9.9 .9 unless you patch the source code. But it's it's probably in 9.10 or 9.11. Okay. Then we have uh, another question here. Let me see. As we saw, query logging has quite a performance impact, which will give us pause. Can we have query error logging turned on without query logging turned on? Does this make sense? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's a very similar question uh, that, uh, like, like uh, uh, Paul has has asked here. Um, that either DNS tab or um, the other option is to um, to get the data from the network, meaning uh, to use um, um, a tool that um, that that uh, records all the DNS uh, requests and answers on port 53 on the network level, something like TCP dump or Wireshark. Or uh, there are specialized tools uh, available, open source tools like DNS Top, like uh, these tools, um, get the data from um, the network layer and uh, create uh, statistics. I would um, look for DNS Top. DNS Top should be available in most Linux distributions. And uh, similar tools can be found that write to uh, a log file instead of uh, showing the statistics directly on the screen. OK. So let me see here. Can you please share the I'm um, sorry? Yes. Uh, for, the, for the broken link for log eater, 
um, I will uh, put the link in the GitHub README. So if you use the GitHub link, you will see that like in the next 10 minutes or so, I will fix it there. I also will uh, write a tweet on the minimized uh, Twitter account um, and put the, the link in there. Sorry about the not working link. Mm -hmm. No, so, uh, and then we say here, can you please share the presentation slides and would it be possible to share it also for future presentations? I was not able to find any links in the invite or confirmation. Um, yeah, we always have them on SlideShare. Mm -hmm. That's right, Dagmar. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, we have it there. Yeah, and we will I, I'm also not sure share. If, if, they are, if they are downloadable from SlideShare, I'm not sure. No, we, and, and uh, of course, as I said at the beginning, that um, I will email uh, everybody that uh, signed up and joined us today the uh, recording and the slides. So, okay. um, should be with them uh, tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I will give you then the, the updated slides with the corrected link for the log eater. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't have any more questions at the moment. So, um, I think we should just wrap it up and um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today and I really hope that you enjoyed this webinar. And as said before, I will be emailing you the, the recording and the slides and uh, hope that you will join us for the future webinars. So, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll say goodbye for now. See you next time. Yeah, bye-bye.